Hello, welcome to this series on always on availability groups. In this series, uh, we're going to talk about SQL Server Always On and implement SQL Server Always On. This particular video is basically to introduce you to the concept and also deep dive into some architectural design of how the typical always on availability group is been deployed i'd recommend highly recommend for that matter that you have had hands-on experience on windows failover clustering and also database mirroring before you start to learn about always on availability group so if you have not i will highly recommend that you go ahead and do that first so what is always on availability groups so i'm going to go through each of these bullet points to save us a lot of time i have prepared all the things that we need to work with today so always on availability groups is a database mirroring technique for microsoft sql server that allows administrators to pull together a group of user databases that can fail over together so you know when we implemented database mirroring when it's time to fail over we are only targeting just one database in the case of always on we're gonna have multiple databases that will fail over together at once so one of the prerequisites is that it is built on top of Windows failover cluster so before you can carry on to implement always on the very first things or one of the first things you need to do is to have your Windows server configured as a Windows failover cluster first typically in the real world you wouldn't have to do this it depends on the shop in which you're working the sysadmins or the DevOps uh, team would have uh, made this available but the company may actually not be as big to afford uh, making people focus on certain areas uh, in the IT department so I have been in situations before where the sysadmins uh, are not knowledgeable enough to implement Windows failover cluster so they have to rely on the DBA to do that and that's why I highly recommend that you uh, as, an, as a DBA have the knowledge in implementing these and not just rely and say uh, it's the job of a sysadmin. Right. Traditional database mirroring in SQL Server was only for single database and always on availability groups are designed to be used for multiple databases. So that's uh, exactly what I just spoke about. There's no point uh, going into that further. Another benefit is that generating multiple replicas of an availability group allows an administrator to make one of them read only for example if they want a group of databases for report purposes only this can now be achieved and what this is basically saying is we can have a primary server and a set of secondary servers as your disaster recovery the good thing is you can designate any of those secondaries to be read only so that you don't use it just for disaster recovery alone you also use it for load balancing in a situation where the primary server is being used for reporting and also read and write activities or kind of workload you can actually route all the read only activities to one of the secondaries because the data in the secondaries don't change uh, differently from how the primary changes so it is the same copy of the primary that is on the secondary hence you can rely on the secondary to be the same data and use it for for read only purposes so this is one of the great benefits that always on availability groups gives us and that way you may have actually offloaded 50% of the workload from the primary and allow the primary to focus on the read write activities or on, if it's an OLTP workload you want to de dedicate the primary database for you can simply do that and eventually you have a system that is well balanced 
And finally, an always on availability group supports a set of primary databases as well as multiple set of secondary databases. So that's also uh, in addition to the things that I already mentioned. So when you have secondary databases, you can basically designate one or two of them as the secondary uh, read only. So these things I've highlighted because as a DBA, you need to have um, awareness of this when it comes to making decisions, right? So up to four in SQL Server 2012. So if your company is implementing 2012 version of SQL Server, you can only have up to four secondary replicas. They're called replicas. In 2014 and 2016, you can have up to eight SQL Server uh, secondary replicas. An administrator can configure an availability group to replicate synchronously for high availability or asynchronously for disaster recovery. We're going to go and dive into the synchronous and asynchronous bits in the near future. For those who have already done database mirror mirroring already, you would to, to a very comfortable degree already understand what we're talking about when we're talking about synchronous and asynchronous. But as far as it's the same concept, so as far as our always on goes, we will see that in action uh, by the time we, we get into that. To save us a lot of time, I have actually prepared a, a simple architecture so that uh, we don't spend time drawing all of this uh, while the video is going on. But I'm just going to explain to you what the basic architecture or basic deployment of always on looks like. Right here, uh, let me actually change this to black. Okay, so at this level, these are all the clients. So this can be you or me on our uh, mobile phone devices and uh, laptop, for example. And what we're doing is hitting facebook.com. All right, so Facebook com is basically an application that's sitting on some server and it needs to store its data somewhere right now these are the databases we're talking about so if you look at this this is the primary database and these are the secondary replicas right so what happens is there's a layer here called a listener so this listener is basically what Facebook is connecting to Facebook.com, which is the application, is not aware that there are multiple databases in the back end. It's only talking to just one layer, which is the listener. And providing the li SQL listener, which is going to be a virtual IP address. So it's just to see if it's contacting a, ser a database server, right? So you provide you provide the listener's IP address and the port number. Now, you have an option to either provide the IP address or a, a virtual name that resolves to that IP address. So the best practice would obviously be to provide the name because if for some reason you have to destroy the listener, create a new listener, and the IP address has to change, you wouldn't have to go back and modify your application code to start changing the uh, IP address, the new, you know, remove the old one, put the new one. So you can literally just leave the name there. Uh, what happens is the name will resolve to whatever IP address is active at any point in time. So the facebook.com application is connecting to the SQL listener through the port, the default port, which is 1433. This can actually be changed depending on how secure you want your environment to be. So the SQL listener is then responsible for routing the traffic based on what you're trying to do. It's going to route the traffic either to the primary or to the secondary. So let's say, for example, this secondary server one is the read only replica so if this is the read-only replica what happens is if um, 
maybe this user is basically trying to run some report to you you know facebook has this this functionality where you can actually go and see report of let's say for example you have uh, placed some facebook advertisement you want to see how your uh, your advert has been running uh, how many people have had clicks how many views how many comments what's the uh, do you have organic traffic or paid traffic you know those kinds of reports you can actually do that from the facebook app and the configuration may have been done in such a way that this SQL listener understands that what you're trying to do is to read only. It routes the traffic to the read only replica right here. If your intent is probably to upload new pictures, which is going to persist the data, it's actually going to route it to the primary instance right here. So that's uh, the architecture, how it is. Now, something you need to bear in mind for you or for those who already have implemented uh, SQL Server failover cluster. Remember that in that kind of configuration, all the clustered instances actually share one, one uh, drive where they store their data. That is not true for always on. Each of the instances have their own drive and that's what you see right here so I've just used this notation here D is drive so meaning the primary has its data uh, the disk that it stores this drive attached to it the secondary has its own disk the, all the other secondaries they all have their own disk they don't share any disk at all so this is one big difference between uh, SQL Server failover clustering and always on availability groups right but you then wonder how they have the same data if they don't share the same disk so how come they can obtain the same you know state of, of, of the data and that's based on the database mirroring technology don't forget that this was actually based on uh, database mirroring, which it ships its logs to the secondary uh, instance. And that's the same thing that's happening. So the primary, and that's the uh, dot notation in red here. So the primary will be shipping the, the logs to the secondary. So it happens for each of the secondary. It ships to this secondary one, it ships to the secondary two, it ships to secondary three, and so forth, on and so forth. So you can imagine already that the more secondary uh, replicas you have, the more work you're given the primary uh, to do because it has to ship the logs to the uh, destination servers, which are the secondary instances. So that's pretty much the basic deployment of uh, an always on availability ground. That's what we're going to be doing. There are a few uh, more bits that you may consider. So for example, all of these may actually be in one single domain controller. So uh, let me put a layer around it. So let's say, let's say all of this right here. Okay, at this point, they may actually belong to the same domain con controller. And that means, say, let's say, for example, their internal IP address is something like 10.10.1.1. 10 uh, let's say 1. To far uh, to four, right? No, one to yeah, one to four. So that means uh, the primary uh, instance will be ten dot ten dot one dot one. This one will be ten dot ten ten dot one dot two dot three dot four, right? So they be all belong to the same subnet within the same uh, domain controller, right? Okay, you can now have this one. On a different subnet so this can actually be on another subnet beg your pardon 
and being on the uh, different subnet may then mean it has 10.10.2 10 .1 for example now this you would see things like geo clustering so you can actually google this and read a little more about that so there is support for geo clustering for uh, always an availability group and what basically happens is this can serve as your disaster recovery right so what happens is say for example if this data center goes down completely or this subnet goes down completely you can have this remaining as your disaster recovery so that um, even though the, there will be a minimal downtime but you wouldn't lose your data so you can manually fail over the primary onto the fourth secondary which is in on, on a different subnet completely and then uh, bring it back up and reroute your Facebook to this one right here. So this also uh, is, a, is a possible architecture that can be deployed. So one last thing I'd like to do, uh, because our time is running out, I want to make sure that the videos are kept to as uh, minimal as possible. So before you actually start implementing SQL Server always on availability groups, you need to spend a lot of time on this page. So you have to Google prereqs, or restrictions or recommendations for always on availability groups and make sure that you check all the boxes. So you can have your own Word document that has all these things there and um, you can basically check the boxes once you imp make sure that you have all these things uh, set up. So for example, ensure that the system is not a domain controller. Uh, part of the requirement is that you need to do this within a domain controller. We've done that in Windows failover clustering already before. So you can use the same domain to add new servers that you intend to use for always on availability group but make sure that where you're deploying your always on is not the domain controller so you spend time to read through all of these requirements and we're basically going to be uh, ensuring that we've fulfilled most of the core requirements before we implement our always on at all so this is a very brief introduction and it's the conceptual knowledge that you need to have before you go and uh, go ahead to start implementing always on so before you go for any interview at all for this try as much as possible to get your hands on it and work with it by so doing you'll be able to answer any or at least 90 percent of the questions that may come up as far as uh, clustering and always on uh, goes so see you in the next couple of videos as we continue to implement our solution.